Um, so today we have with us uh, our, our team for marine conservation in the Pacific, and we're going to be talking in particular about the Coral Triangle work that we do. The Coral Triangle is one of the, probably the most important area for marine conservation in the whole world, and it's an enormously important thing that the US, U.S. government is helping to support through AID. So I, I know you'll find it very interesting today. Today we have uh, with us also uh, Emily Tibbet, who's the Washington-based director for our uh, Asia-Pacific operations in the back there. We have Bill Rayner, who has been with the Nature Conservancy for 20 years, most of that resident in Pohnpei and Micronesia. I know you're very sympathetic for him to be isolated off there in a tropical paradise instead of living here in Washington, D.C. And uh, with him uh, we have um, Abdul Hamid, who is the head of marine conservation for uh, the Indonesia for the Nature Conservancy, and Willie Atu, who has the same role in marine conservation but for the Solomon Islands. So today, even though in, in honor of the event they have put on suits, they are not Washington suits. <laughs> they are the real people who actually are out there doing the mission. And with that, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bill Rayner. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Bill said, we don't have to pull our suits out very often, and I have to actually inspect mine if the moths have gotten to it, since I only do it about every two years or so. Um, I'd also usually start a talk in the middle of winter in Washington, D.C., talking about my little tropical paradise where I've lived for the last 32 years, but I understand it's going to get 70 degrees outside today, so no one's going to care. But anyway, thank you very much all for coming today. We, um, we prepared a little bit of information on the Coral Triangle for you all, and I think we'll take you I can figure this out. We'll, st we'll take you around 12 time zones away to the Coral Triangle. Today we want to talk a little bit about the Coral Triangle itself, the biological Coral Triangle. Tell you a little bit about the, the recent initiative that was uh, done by the six Coral Triangle countries uh, in 2009 that they've committed to. A little bit about the conservation work out there that's being shared by WWF, Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy some of the challenges in that work and into the future, and then a little bit about our future, the, the future of the Coral Triangle. So get right into it. So the coral reefs that span the Southeast Asia and, and the Western Pacific Islands are, are the richest and most productive in the world. This area here, laser pointer, this here is called the Coral Triangle. The red line there is actually the biological Coral Triangle. This is an area where you find over 500 species of coral. 500 species, about 75% of all the coral in the world. Within that red line, we also find 3,000 species, over 3,000 species of fish. Now compare that to the Caribbean, hope there's nobody from the Caribbean here, 61 species of coral. So what's that? Can't do my math real quick. 15% of what's in the coral triangle. This is an extremely diverse area biologically. The outer dotted line is the, is the political boundaries of what we're calling the political coral triangle, or, or we're working the coral triangle. Uh, it's six countries made up of Malaysia, Indonesia, they're running around the bottom, uh, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and going out to the Solomon Islands in the Western Pacific. So that's the coral triangle we're talking about today. Now this area is not only biologically important, but it's also extremely extremely economically important. They, the, the, this area has a massive tourism industry and growing all the time. There's also a massive fisheries industry coming out of these six countries. Um, the recent estimates have been uh, for, for the value of the coral reefs and associated ecosystems, about $2.3 billion a year income into these countries. So this is not, uh, you know, it's not a small matter. This is critical to these countries. <coughs> Healthy reef systems, as we've heard in the past, also protect the islanders, the people who live on these islands and in these countries from natural disasters. Uh, many of you might remember the Boxer Day uh, type, uh, sorry, the tsunami in 2004. And after the tsunami, there was a lot of work done in recovery, and it was found that uh, you know, villages that kept their mangroves intact suffered a lot less damage and a lot less death than villages who had taken out their mangroves for shrimp farming or whatever. So, these are critical to people's health and security. So the CT is the world's highest uh, marine priority because of the things I've told you about. And also, uh, you know, this area is critical to the stability of these six countries and also uh, both politically, economically, and also for food security. But like many parts of the world, 
the coral triangle faces a number of threats. Um, these threats can include things like fishing, uh, overfishing and destructive fishing, um, unsustainable land use, poorly planned coastal development, and also uh, sea level rise, and also global, you know, the, the sea level warming. So all these threats are starting to hit the Coral Triangle right now. A lot of people live here, about 650 million people live on the coast of these, island, of these countries. So the Coral Triangle is increasingly at risk uh, for irreversible damage. Scientists estimate that we probably have a short time frame to turn the trends around, probably about a decade. And so it's critical that we don't let this area go any longer. We really need to get serious about pr uh, protecting these coral reefs and associated ecosystems in the Coral Triangle. Here's a map. I don't know how well you can see that. This talks about the uh, reefs at risk. And recent studies have showed about 80% of the Coral Triangle's reefs are already at risk. 50% of the reefs are what we consider high risk. In other words, they're already suffering damage that could be irreversible. So this is, you know, we're already working with an area that's not pristine. There's a lot of threats there. Again, it's overfishing, destructive fishing, cyanide fishing, things like, um, you know, it, the whole idea of a lot of development going on along the coast, sediment smothering the reefs. All this is happening in this part of the world. And actually, because the, on this trend for destruction, scientists estimate that probably, you know, if we don't do something, all these reefs will be destroyed in the next 50 years. We'll lose all the reefs just by climate change and just by the current uh, trend of destruction. So this is a really, really serious issue, and it, it's going to have extremely big consequences on the economies and the political stability of this part of the world. So it's something we really need to take very seriously. Uh, the, the nice news is that a lot of these threats are reversible because they're human impact threats, so we can do something about it if we get on top of it. Um, but up to date, we haven't really had a vehicle to turn the threats around, to work at a large enough scale to really address this massive area, 2.3 million square miles. So what does the Nature Conservancy do in Coral Triangle? We've been there about 20 years, working in the countries of uh, Indonesia again, on the bottom here, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, those three countries we work in. Uh, over, the, over the last 20 years, we've worked with partners to protect about 7 million hectares of reefs. Now, we, most of these are what we call marine protected areas, but I understand in the U.S., MPA has a negative connotation. Our, the way we see marine protected areas and the way they are worked, worked in the Coral Triangle, they're actually managed areas, areas that are managed for both human benefits and nature benefits. And they're usually zoned areas where people can do different types of activities. And I think when my two colleagues talk about how we're working on the ground, you'll see that when we talk about MPAs in Asia, we're not talking about strictly no-take. So it's a slightly different uh, definition. Now, due to the increased severity of threats over the last 10 years, just seeing these threats increase and increase, and seeing our efforts and WW efforts and CI efforts and you know, the other organizations, we're, we're just not turning the tide. So we, we tried to change the way we work, moving away from strictly site work. We're trying to bring that site work and what we've learned over 20 years, trying to turn that into policy, trying to work with the national governments. And that eventually, led to the Coral Triangle. So here was our vehicle. I said we didn't have a vehicle to address these threats. In 2009, the six leaders of the Coral Triangle countries, that the, let's see if I can figure this out, Solomon Islands, East Timor, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and Malaysia, came together at the World Ocean Conference in Manado, which is out on the very tip of Sulawesi, the northern tip, and they committed to the Coral Triangle Initiative on coral reefs I always get this mixed up. Coral reefs, fisheries, and food security. And that initiative is, they, they, the, the six leaders have, have, um, have committed to a regional plan of action to actually address key threats. Some of the things, the chapters in that regional plan, plan of action or the big focuses are priority, um, priority seascapes. They also agree to work together on ecosystem approach to fisheries, in other words, really addressing fisheries issues for the first time in a coordinated fashion and eco using ecosystem-based management. Marine protected areas, getting a system through the whole, through the whole area to protect their, their coral reefs. Climate change adaptation, so trying to look at adaptation and how, how they can get, get ahead of climate change. And then last, they wanna, they're working on threatened species together. So the CTI, to me and to our, my colleagues, seems to be 
it, it is the best vehicle we have going forward to really get these countries working together on big issues at a scale that's going to make a difference. In addition, um, the, CTI, the CTI, the Coral Triangle Initiative, it gives us the first opportunity to actually work, on, work regionally on some of the big threats like shark finning, uh, illegal, unre unregulated, and unreported fishing, the whole live reef fish trade. These are the kind of issues that just kind of fall through the cracks. The tuna industry, this is the, the heart of the, of, the, of the giant tuna industry in the Pacific. All the spawning grounds are in these islands and a lot of the young juvenile life cycles in there. So we, we need these guys to work on these regional issues together and they haven't had a vehicle to do that until the Coral Triangle Initiative came about. So the U.S. government is actually the first government that stepped up to support the, what we call the CT6, the Coral Triangle Six Countries. The U.S. government uh, is working right now in an effort that uh, includes the U.S. Agency for International Development, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Associ uh, uh, Administration, and the Department of State. And these three agencies are joined by other agencies at times to form what we call the U.S. Coral Triangle Initiative Support Program. And I actually put the website there if you want to learn more about that, that initiative. Um, the U.S. Coral Triangle Support Program is working throughout the region. Some of the recent, uh, they've been together for about three years. Some of the recent things they've accomplished, first of all, they've supported the launch of a CTI regional secretariat. Again, we have this regional initiative moving forward. Uh, this is the first time that the Melanesian countries and the Southeast Asian countries have actually worked together on environmental issues. Um, so this is it's really critical to get that regional governance piece in place. So the U.S. has been critical, critically important uh, to getting that CTI secretariat launched and, and, and designed. They've also been supporting regional thematic groups in the areas of marine protected areas, on climate change adaptation, and also in fisheries. Getting the experts from the six countries, uh, uh, connecting them with experts from other places so they can move forward on strategies that will really make a difference across the Coral Triangle. Uh, they've also been working closely with uh, U.S. institutions to make our U.S. research and our U.S. Um, uh, science capacity available to the countries there and the institutions in those six countries. They've also been sharing best practices. The CTI, U.S. CTI has been very into sharing best practices from other parts of the world with the, with the, the leaders of conservation there. And last, um, they've worked hard to enhance communications. So, you know, a lot of times, like I said, the Melanesians, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands really never talk to the Indonesians. So it's the first time they're actually working together as colleagues trying to move forward strategies in a joint way, trying to learn from each other about what they've done. So it's a really exciting initiative trying to bring these countries together that haven't traditionally worked together in the past. Oops. Now what I do? I knew I'd hit the wrong button. Going forward. Ah. What did I do? I froze it up. Thank you. <laughs> we don't have these things on our little island, so. The main conduit for the U.S. support to date has been the Coral Triangle Support Program. Now, that's different than the U.S. CTI. It's actually a USAID-funded project. It's fi a five-year duration. We're in year three. Uh, actually, we're in year four right now, so three and a half years into a five-year project. It's, a, it's run by a consortium led by WWF the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International. So together, this is the first time the three big NGOs uh, in the region, the bingos, have gotten together and worked together on something big. So this is, it's a, a 40 million or $32 million project. Um, it's um, under the umbrella of the US CTI and it's, all, it's uh, part of the Regional Development Mission to Asia, the RDMA. The goal of the CTSP is to improve the management of biologically and economically important coastal and marine resources and associated ecosystems to support the livelihoods and the economies in the Coral Triangle. So to me it's very exciting because I've been working with the Conservancy for 20 years, focused on biodiversity, focused on conservation. This project forces us to think bigger and how does biodiversity actually contribute to the economies of these countries and how does it contribute to livelihoods, human health. So it's really bringing everything together in a big way for our three organizations. Um, 
The CTSP has supported several projects uh, for, for us, a regional project. We've been involved over the last two years in working with the six countries to design a regional marine protected area network. What would that look like across the Coral Triangle? How can we you know, capture the representative biodiversity? How can we also work in climate change resilience so we know that these protected areas, if there's climate change impacts in the future and we see coral bleaching or coral death, that we will have areas of refugia that can, can re replant those reefs, can pr provide uh, larvae that will recolonize the leaf reefs that are ruined. Eh? We're also working on a CT atlas. This is the first time that everybody in the region has brought their data together into one database. And I don't know if you can realize how important that is, but you know, we have lots of different people measuring different things. There's tons of information out there, but no one has their hands on all of it. So the CT atlas has been a, a massive effort by a lot of organizations to pull all that information together in one place. We've also worked hard um, recently the, over the last year trying to look at you know, marine protected areas. We've been developing them for biodiversity conservation. How can we also use marine protected areas to, to, to uh, improve fisheries and also to deal with climate change adaptation? So we just finished a, a big project on that. We had a bunch of experts come together. We're now using that as guidance throughout the Coral Triangle for a new way to design marine protected areas so they do more than just, just biodiversity conservation. We've worked a lot on capacity building. In other words, you know, it's a big region, fairly low conservation and, and, and science capacity. We've been really focusing a lot on training people, helping them do management, figuring out what management <laughs> effectiveness looks like. In other words, you have a protected area, a lot of paper parks out there. How do you take a paper park and actually have it have conservation, real conservation impacts, real economic impacts? And how do you measure that and show that you're having that impact? And last, we've got some great work going on on the ground and in the water. So I think for that piece, I'd like to uh, introduce again my colleague Halim uh, Abdul Halim from the Indonesia Marine Program to talk a little bit about some of the conservation work going on in Indonesia. Halim. Um, thank you very much, Bill. I'm going to um, take you a little bit to uh, the island where I live in Indonesia, um, the island of, of Bali, and tell you um, a little bit on the work that we are currently doing uh, in, in, in that island uh, with the support of the uh, U.S. government. Um, some of you may have already probably have been visiting Bali or at least um, heard about, about, about it. Um, what I'm going to be telling you is about the work that we are doing in a small island in, in, in southeastern part of the island of Bali uh, called uh, Nusa Penida uh, Island da down here. Um, I've been living in Bali uh, for the past uh, 10 years, and um, of course, uh, Bali is one of the major tourist destination sites uh, in the world. And I have seen really some real impact of, of, of mass tourism uh, in, in some places, some major destination places in the island of Bali, especially in, 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 in Nusa Penida. Um, there are two uh, major um, impacts or future threats, if you like, that is now uh, this little island um, is currently um, uh, facing. Number one is uh, the mass tourism has had a, a, a real, um, you know, threat, if you like. We've seen some a real threat to the, the, to the biodiversity um, of, of the island. And the second one, uh, the, this little island, um, we've already seen some um, friction, if you like, uh, happen among the, use, the, the different users uh, of the coastal areas, especially the tourism uh, industry and, 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 and the seaweed um, farmer, because this island is actually one of the producer uh, for the seaweed, um, seaweed farmer in, in Indonesia. So um, looking at this um, situation, if you like, the, the Nature Conservancy was invited by the district government and the provincial government to help out, what is sort of the way out that we can um, work together to solve this problem? And the Nature Conservancy um, believe, if you like, in the, develop, in, in the de establishment of a marine protected area as a tool for uh, resource management. And again, as Bill Reiner has mentioned, that marine protected area that we uh, are embracing, if you like, in Indonesia is a, is, is a management area that will allow 
a multiple um, use. So it's not totally a, a full protected area, but it's actually an area that is designed through a zoning system that will allow um, different um, uh, use um, system, if you like, in, in it. So we're working very closely with the local uh, stakeholder. We had a very extensive consultation with um, almost uh, all um, stakeholder, if you like, um, uh, of, of, of the island, including the tourism sector, the seaweed farmer, uh, local and, and, and national government to develop this zoning, um, the, the zoning system. And in addition, we also um, envision to develop um, sort of the code of conduct for sustainable tourism. Um, that will be embedded in the, in the management plan of the Nusa Penida uh, Marine Protected Area. So, um, as you can see, um, uh, in 2010, um, the Nature Conservancy, together with the district government and the national government, declared the area, the Nusa Penida MPA, uh, the Nusa Penida Island as a marine protected area, covering an area of uh, 20,000 20, um, um, hectare. And again, um, this is just to, 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 to tell you again how important the area is for, 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 for local people. This is, this is one of the, the, the pictures of the, the family of the seaweed farmer. The seaweed farmer is, is, is an industry that involves heavily, actually, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the woman in, 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 that, in, that, in that practice. So, um, again, it's sort of the whole family business, if you like, that involves everybody in, in, in the family, the, 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 the women and, and, and children. Um, and we're happy. Um, in 2010, um, finally, the, the national government, together with the district government, formally declared uh, marine, um, Nusa Penida as, as a marine protected area. And if you can, if, as, as you see from, from this picture, we have the happy celebration in the Balinese, uh, you know, a traditional ceremony where we have the Ministry of, of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of, of the Republic in, in, of Indonesia. So it's, it's actually the former minister because he was just um, replaced uh, recently, uh, three, four mon months ago. And of course, we have the, the, the um, U.S. ambassador to Indonesia, uh, His Excellency Scott Marshall, uh, declaring the uh, Nusa Penida uh, marine protected uh, area. Um, we understand that the Conservancy as an international NGO will not always be working in, in this area in, in perpetuity. And we also understand uh, that the U.S. government support will not always uh, be there in, in perpetuity. So the, transi the, the sustainability plan for the place where we work is very much crucial for our work. And we uh, envisioned that sustainability plan early on when we started our, our, our program. And last year, we, um, we have already been successful to transfer the work, our work in Nusa Penida Island to our local partner, to an uh, Indonesian-based non-government organization called the Coral Triangle Center. And all the work that, 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 that we are doing now has been taken over by these uh, local non-government organizations, and the Nature Conservancy make itself available for any technical assistance uh, you know, regarding the scientific development of the zoning, uh, the adaptive management, as well as the uh, MPA uh, management um, development. And all this great work would not happen without the support of the U.S. government, um, uh, in this case, the um, U.S. Um, AID. So that's my story basically about our work in, in, in Bali, in Nusa Penida. Thank you. Thanks, Salim. Now we're going to take you about 2,000 miles to the east to the Solomon Islands. So, uh, Willie? In 1995, the Nature Conservancy was invited by the Solomon Island government to come to the Solomons and settle a dispute that is occurring between, uh, uh, maybe I should say, environmental uh, refugees. Solomon Islands was part of the British protectorate. And in 1960s, they have a long spell of drought in the northern part of the Pacific, in the Phoenix Islands, due to the uh, you know, uh, explorations by the British. So the people expel long, experienced long spells of droughts. 
So the British government repatriated them, and there are some islands in the Solomons that they put them in there. Uh, it so happened that uh, these people are marine orientated compared to Solomon Islanders who are t uh, terrestrially based. And so the resource on a very small island that is, um, it's pictured there, is called the Anavan Islands. It's being exploited to the brink of totally destroyed. So the Nature Conservancy came in there and uh, after working for uh, a number of years, the resources recovered. And uh, my work, when I started with the Nature Conservancy, is to go around in the communities and make educational awareness. And as land are uh, owned by traditional people, I do co traditional co consultations. And it so happened that when I did this awareness in the communities, no one sort of bothered about it. Majority of the people in Solomon Islands are subsistence based or based on natural resources. So we had a meeting that is close to the Anavans, and I said to them, hey, I've been coming here and giving talks, and it does not matter to, to you, but uh, I would like to invite you all to come over to the Anavans and have a look at what we're doing. It so happened that people were excited about it, so I took them across. When they stepped on the island, they feel a total difference compared to where they come from. They feel that nature is so close. And someone said to me, I feel that God is very close here. Yeah. It so happened that they go back to their various villages and communities, and they said that we would like a similar anavans in our villages. So it sort of opened up our work, and we moved, moved on to the uh, province that is not to the Solomons, closer to Papua New Guinea. And we worked in there. The province is called Choisal Province. We worked in there, and the anavan is... is it's so like it, it becomes an icon in the Solomons, and uh, it happened that uh, it was recognized in 2008 that it received an Equator Initiative Prize that was presented to the local communities in Barcelona at the World Conservation Congress. It so happened that uh, the work that we have done because of the Anavan moved on to Toizel. The Nature Conservancy involved in that province as well to make a conservation plan for the province. And they have an indigenous organization. They call themselves the Lauruland Conference of Tribal Community. They come together and they made a resolution that we would like to have protected areas in our province. We assisted them in doing that. And it so happened that uh, we presented this report to the national government. And uh, it, it catches their attention. And so they invited us, the Nature Conservancy as well, to assist them in doing the National Biodiversity Diversity Strategy Action Plan that is a requirement by the Conservation of Biological Diversity. Last year, in 2011, with the CTI, uh, USAID CTI, CTSP, they invited like you will see in the previous slide that Mr. Rayner has shown that the decision is down at the national level where the leaders of the six countries come together. It goes down to the second layer of the government as well. So they invited the mayors of all the city six countries represented to come to, to, to Indonesia and see what is going on in there. It so happened that our work in Chozo has a, like recognized by the national government. So the representative of uh, of Solomon Islands was uh, one of the representatives was the mayor was the mayor from Choiso. When they came and shared other experiences and they've seen what is going on in Indonesia with the other leaders of the city six countries, they go back and they were challenged. So they invited all the mayors in the country together and tell them that we have seen something that we would like to share with you. And so they worked together and they put out uh, what they call a communique or a pact telling the communities and they will assist the communities to to look after their natural resources. I'm glad to tell you here this morning that uh, we supported the provincial government and in uh, assisting them to have legislations and policies at the provincial level, at the lower level government 
in order for them to support the local communities in looking after their natural resources for future more years to come. Thank you so much. Uh, wait, I've got a few. I'm just going to. I'm just going to summarize a little bit. So, um, thank you, Willie and Halim. These are two of uh, my favorite local conservation heroes, and I've been a great privilege to privilege to work with them in their two countries over the last several years. Um, just a few wind-up slides here. So, I think you can see from these two stories, and this is just a small slice of what the consortium WWF. Conservation International and TNC are doing uh, as part of this CTSP, the Conservation, uh, the, sorry, the Coral Triangle Support Partnership, just a small slice of the program that's being made there. I think it's really exciting uh, to, to point out that, you know, great progress is being made. You know, there's some idea that this isn't being a successful project. We see effective site models throughout the region being formed now that are starting to be leveraged off to new partners and new places through the, local, through the local governments. We have information systems in place. We have uh, growing regional cooperation on some of the big trounce boundary issues that haven't been uh, suitably addressed till now. And we're also seeing a, a, a functioning, we're close to having a functioning regional secretariat. Some of the challenges facing us is scaling up. As I said earlier, this is a large, diverse region. You have Melanesia, Indonesia, lots of differing levels of development and education. Um, we really need to focus heavy on trying to build the human capacity to do this kind of work in the future and to expand it throughout the Coral Triangle. We also have to keep working on you know, the challenge of regional governments. How do you get country governance? How do you get countries that don't traditionally work together to work together and really address big, hairy issues? Um, we also have a problem with political turnover. You know, this is a high-level commitment by leaders. The leader moves on. Does it stay as one of the development priorities for that country, or how do we get the new leaders to, to, to keep on with it? And then last, you know, insufficient really bilateral and multilateral lateral support. We've got some support from the U.S. Germany, Australia has, has stepped up. Uh, the Asian Development Bank and the Global Environment Facility have been donors too, but there's still a lot more to do, and we need a lot more resources if we're really going to pull off the, the Coral Triangle vision. Um, in the future, quickly, uh, we have to continue the support of the countries on their national plans of action. Each of the countries does have national plans of action to carry out their Coral Triangle uh, duties. We need to keep supporting those countries to do that until they can get the resources together to do it themselves. We need to really increase that support for building the human capacity. You know, so far, I mean, a lot of our organizations, TNC, WWF, we do have a lot of local people working for us, but again, we are bingos, we're uh, outside organizations. We really need to build that local capacity to do this work and take it on and spread it through the countries. We also need to um, work on sustainable funding. Because the real success of the Coral Triangle is when they no longer need outside funding from other countries to do this work. And the Indonesia and some of the other countries have stepped up with resources, but there's still a lot more to do as far as trying to fund this effort and really expand the, the uh, conservation. And the last point I'd like to make, you know, I, we're, I think all, of, all three of the consortium members, and Darcy here from CI2 who might uh, also uh, vouch for me, we do hope that there will be a CTSP, a CTSP2. CTSP1 run, runs out in a year and a half. It's done some really great stuff on the ground. It is the only U.S. CTI component that actually touches the ground. And I think it's clear from the work here that we've got great work on the ground, and that's being leveraged up to really change policy and transform the way conservation is being done across the region. So last, I'd like to thank the uh, International Conservation Caucus Foundation for arranging this event today. And, uh, my colleagues and I would welcome any comments, questions, or discussion. Thank you very much. I know, I know we're kind of running up on time here, but um, and everybody's welcome to stay afterwards to talk to uh, um, some of our speakers. Um, anybody have any questions that they, they'd like to raise? Um, I know they've gone over a lot of different uh, issues. Islands. I'm from Congressman Sablon's office from the Northern Mariana Islands. And uh, I saw that there are some training activities available for the CTI countries. Um, and I know that we have different benthic communities in the territories and, and different coral reef issues, but we kind of are, we're kind of suffering from the similar um, tourism effects and, and ecological effects from global warming. But are the training events for the CTI available for the territories, the American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, uh, when you're holding them, the training and the conferences that, that kind of uh, 
could address some of our issues. Well, thanks for your question. I can answer that because I actually used to run the Micronesia program. And, uh, you know, the Commonwealth of Northern Rand is, is one of the, uh, the Micronesia Challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. commit, they made the commitment to the Micronesia Challenge. Through the Micronesia Challenge, I think uh, CI and, and, and TNC are also trying to make the same uh, programs available. And actually, a lot of the stuff we're doing in, this, in the CTI, uh, we started doing in the Micronesia area. So there is quite a bit uh, available. Again, the main funder for a lot of our work in Micronesia and also with Commonwealth is um, NOAA. And NOAA has a lot of training programs going on. We also have a Young Champions program where we're taking young people. We've got, I think we've got two Young Champions from, the North, from Commonwealth right now that are actually, uh, as part of their school thing, we give them a computer and they get to work two years with one of the local partners, one of the local NGOs or with the government agency, and that kind of gets them onto the pipeline to become future leaders. There's also, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Let's take that one offline. Uh, there's quite a bit available. But yeah, this, the stuff in the CTI, pretty much because of just the, the, uh, the, 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 the challenge of bringing people from you know, Micronesia to anywhere in the Coral Triangle, it's a two-day trip that's uh, extremely expensive. So we try to bring the training to Micronesia. Sure, if, if, if the Commonwealth has funding, that'd be great. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, any other? Great, wow, we did such a great job explaining. There's no questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks so much uh, for coming. I know it's a very busy uh, week here. Um, and uh, please make sure all these cupcakes are gone so we don't need to tread with them home. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>